to the Word of God this morning. Um, we're going to be using various texts, but if you would, open your Bibles, please, with me at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And just for a moment, just keep your, your finger there as we'll come to the text shortly. But I want to speak this morning on the thought, well, and about the unknown warrior, the unknown warrior. Some of you will probably be familiar with this. And uh, in Westminster Abbey, down there in London, many of you have probably even seen it on your visits to London throughout your lifetime, there is a tomb dedicated to the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. And what I would actually like to do this morning is use that physical picture of the unknown warrior and the tomb of the unknown warrior as a biblical illustration for us this morning. And actually, they're not as far divorced as we go through it. But to do so, to do so, what I would like to actually do is to tell you something of the information about that tomb. And I want you to absorb that information information in case you're not familiar with it already and if you are then it'll be a, a refresher and a reminder purely for this simplicity because if you absorb the information then there will be a, a very smooth transition and a crossover to the word of God to application even in our own lives uh, maybe we've got some unknown warriors in here today Christian soldiers here today so may the Lord help us with these things this morning. So what we're going to do, we'll just pray, and then I'll come, and I'll go through the illustration, and then we'll look in the Word of God, and hope the Lord will touch our hearts and minds this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, as we talk this morning, as we look at the illustration or the object lesson, the physical truth of the tomb of the unknown warrior, we should be reminded of two things, that Jesus Christ himself, is the ultimate unknown warrior. Known by few, but yet still unknown by so many. But Heavenly Father, for us who are in Christ, then we will find some great parallels and comparisons between our lives in Christ, as soldiers of Christ, in the army of faith, and the man in that tomb who gave his life in the First World War. Father, help us, guide us, and lead us by your word and your spirit. Change our hearts, Lord. Strengthen us who are in Christ. Any who are with us and among us this morning who don't know Christ as Savior are not yet born again. And, Father, I pray you'd break hardened hearts this morning. Soften them, make them fertile that the seed of the truth of your gospel may indeed take root and Christ will be received. Help us, O oh God, in remembrance. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so the idea, the very idea to have a tomb to an unknown warrior, to, uh, to be a dedication through time uh, and a memory, was first conceived in 1916, so in the midst of the First World War, the Great War, and it was by the Reverend David Railton, who was actually an army chaplain, serving out there on the Western, the Western Front. And he had seen, at his time out there, he'd seen a grave that was just marked by a rough wooden cross, uh, and on that rough wooden cross was just a pencil legend, the pencil writing, and what was written, it said, an unknown British soldier. That was all it said, and he was moved by that, to write to then to the then dean of Westminster Westminster Abbey down there in London, who was Herbert Royal, and uh, and in 1920, so following the end of the war, he proposed that an unidentified British soldier, the body of an unidentified British soldier from the battlefields of France, from the Western Front, would be uh, buried with due ceremony in Westminster Abbey, and this would then be marked buried amongst the kings, that was terminology that was used, to represent the many hundreds of thousands of who were then the empire dead, of the British Empire. 
The idea found favour. It was strongly supported by the Dean of Westminster Abbey, but also the then Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. So the idea got legs and grew traction. Now, at that time, throughout the First World War and afterwards, we were under the monarchy of uh, King George V. OK, King George V. And it's important to remember that we were very much uh, in, 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 in awe and reverence of the monarchy. A king, the king, still had great sway in the land. There was great reverence and respect for the king. And King George V would have been the father, of course, of our current Queen Elizabeth II. Now, without going into excessive detail, and if you're interested, please do read it, quite a process and quite a parade were gone into in France itself to actually ensure that the unknown body would be actually known by no one whatsoever. And they actually took four unknown soldiers, mixed up the coffins, mixed them around, and the person who chose them had no idea even which battlefield they'd come from. So the choosing of who was to be the unknown soldier meant that absolutely no one had any idea and never has uh, about who the unknown soldier was. There were parades in France, you can read about it. it's incredible, the reverence, the respect that was given. Even the very rail carriage that the body and the coffin were moved on is now a uh, subject of a restoration project and there's a mock-up of it. I think that's across Surrey Way, it's down in the south, southeast somewhere, I think. Quite a process uh, and worth reading. The casket itself was interesting that was uh, the, the, the soldier was, was placed uh, in. It was uh, banded with iron. It was very, very decorative. It was uh, uh, King George V himself chose the sword of a crusader, a crusading knight from his personal collection. And that sword of the crusader warrior was placed on top of the unknown warrior's tomb before it was uh, brought back to Westminster. Also a shield bearing the inscription a British warrior who fell in the Great War, 1914 to 1918, for king and country. On the day uh, in Westminster Abbey, and that was a, a Remembrance Sunday, 11th of November, 1920 itself. Uh, there was, of course, a parade, a horse-drawn carriage, a parade, but uh, we take ourselves forward actually into Westminster Abbey itself. Um, there was... Um, uh, the grave itself was in the abbey, it's still there. And uh, uh, to cut through all of that for now, because some of it will come into the text, those of you who've seen it will know that that grave, that coffin is marked with a, a black, uh, I think it's Belgian marble topping. And the inscription that is written on the tombstone itself was made of brass that was melted down from the ammunition, or from some of the ammunition, of World War One, so even the very writing itself is to melted brass uh, armaments. The uh, those of you who've been there will know it is the only gravestone, the only tombstone in Westminster Abbey that you cannot walk upon. It is held in such reverence. If you've ever been there, David Livingstone, the great Christian missionary, his grave you can walk all over it. Charles Darwin, his gravestone is over there. You can walk all over that. And some of you were with us that time in London when Dawn was over there, she started stamping up and down on it. <laughs> but the tomb of the unknown warrior, no one is allowed to put a foot. No one is allowed to trample underfoot that tomb. And uh, the tombstone itself, the capstone, has an inscription which was composed by the then Dean of Westminster Abbey, Herbert Edward Royal. Uh, and the words on it are this. I want you to think on these words as we go through them, especially if you're not familiar with them. <laughs> Beneath the stone rests the body of a British warrior. <sighs> I thought I'd go to this all out of my system when I wrote it. <clears throat> Unknown by name or rank. Brought from France to lie among the most illustrious of the land. And buried here on Armistice Day, the 11th of November, 1920. In the presence of His Majesty King George V, his ministers of state, 
the chiefs of his forces and a vast concourse of the nation. Thus are commemorated the many multitudes who during the great war of 1914 to 18 gave the most that man can give life itself for God, for king and country, for loved ones, home and empire, for the sacred cause of justice and the freedom of the world. They buried him among the kings because he had done good toward God and toward his house. Now, that's quite an incredible inscription. And the very end part of that should ring some bells with some of you, but we'll get to that in a little while. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission oversees the graves of over one million British burials. And of those uh, from the First and Second World War, and of those, over 200 thousand 20 percent are unknown now some strides have been made of course through dna but 200,000 are unknown but for those who are the soldiers of the british and the commonwealth unknown warriors unknown graves of the war dead there's an inscription on every headstone for every unidentified soldier and it reads this a soldier of the great war known unto god and or it reads a soldier of the 1939-45 war known unto God. And when you think about that expression that's on there, known unto God, that comes from the Bible. It's used twice, Acts uh, 15 and verse 18 and Philippians 4, 6. Known, in fact, turn to Acts. I uh, know, keep your finger in First Timothy. Just turn there. Let's read just one of those together. Acts chapter 15. We will be turning to a few verses this morning. <clears throat> Acts chapter 15, verse number 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. You see, everyone is known unto God. There is no one out of God's scope. The question is not whether you're known unto God. The question is, do you know him through Jesus Christ? But that phrase reminds me of a time in this land where the word of God was still revealed. Then many of those men on that battlefield would have known Jesus Christ as their Savior, And for that, we're thankful. The word of God was esteemed in this land and the ripple in this land of biblical Christianity had an effect that still impacted every corner of this land and every person in this nation. Those words known unto God on the headstones were actually chosen by the author, who you may be familiar with, Rudyard Kipling. He lost his only son at 18 years of age on the battlefields of the Western Front. He spent, I believe, 18 months trying to find him, could never find him. His son was an unknown soldier. And so he had a hand in choosing those words, known unto God. So we come back to the tomb of the unknown warrior, which is where we started that down in Westminster Abbey, because I want to say this to you. That tomb is very, very closely associated with the Bible. Could you imagine a time when that was so? Would it be so today? It would not. On the tomb of the unknown warrior, five portions of scripture in part are on that tombstone. Four of them from the New Testament on the top, on the bottom, on the left hand side and on the right hand side. The fifth one is a portion from the Old Testament, which made up the very end part of the text that we read, the conclusion of the inscription. So having said all that by way of introduction, what I'd like us to do this morning, I'm going to use those five verses from the Bible that are on the tombstone of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. You can still see it today. And I want us to think about the parallels between the physical and the spiritual. I want us to think about that unknown soldier physically and what happened before the king. And I want us to think about the unknown soldier spiritually, that's the question, and what happens 
before the king. And when we look through this example of the chain of events that took place, then, friends, I hope you'll see a parallel, and I hope we'll see a parallel in our lives today. The first thing I would like us to note about the tomb of the unknown soldier is that he had entered the king's service. He had entered the king's service. Back in those days, before those days even, and even sometimes still today, there was a phrase that was said, when you signed up to join the army, when you volunteered to join the army, that you'd taken the king's shilling. Now that goes back for, from the 1700s uh, to the, to the uh, uh, end of the 1800s. Uh, you didn't actually physically get the king's shilling anymore in the First World War. But that was came from the physical truth that when a, when a, when a man went into service in the, in the British forces, the army or the navy at that time, there was no air force in those days, uh, planes hadn't been invented. But you were actually physically given a shilling from the king, which was your uh, uh, welcome to the army payment. So even by the time of the First World War, it was still a common phrase as the men signed up in their droves, volunteered in their droves, They'd taken the king's shilling. It was a recognition that they were in the service of the king. God, king, and country. That was how it was viewed. Just even only a couple of weeks ago here in Exeter, I was down, I met a man at uh, one of the local karate clubs down in St. Thomas, and I was looking at his club, which is part of an old uh, church hall building. And what he'd done, he'd gone back through some of the history, some of the photographs that he could find down there in St. Thomas. And one of the photographs was quite poignant it was actually a photograph of the men from St. Thomas, because as they had volunteered, as they signed up, as the recruitment people would, would come through for the First World War, the men would line up in the streets with their suits and their flat caps on, and they would start from in St. Thomas, and off they would walk, walk towards their barracks and their transport, and off they would go to war. And there was a photograph with these men of St. Thomas of Exeter, all in lines, caps and suits on, marching off to war. And I looked, knowing the casualty ratio for the First World War, and thought, I wonder, as I look at that photograph, how many of those men ended up lying dead on the Western Front? But turning back was not an option. They were in the king's service. Turning back was not their desire. Oh, yes, we have the benefit, of course, of hindsight looking back. Maybe we wouldn't be so gung-ho, maybe we wouldn't be so brave, but regardless, maybe we would come up with all the criticisms and, uh, and corruptions and all the theories, but the reality of it is those men who went were gallant and brave, and they went in the service of the king, and as soldiers of the king, they went to war. Why? Because King George V served and stood as the figurehead of the British Empire, and it was for the British Empire that they went to fight throughout the war. And that brings me to the first of the verses under this thought, it entered the king's service. The first of the verses that's on the top of that tombstone, if you're back there in 2 Timothy 2, is this, verse number 19. This is what a part, this is the verse where a portion of it is on the tomb of the unknown warrior. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse number 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. On the tomb of the unknown warrior at the top are the words, the Lord knoweth them that are his. You see, the unknown warrior had entered into the service of the physical king. But Jesus Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords and shall reign in complete omnipotency over the whole earth when he returns. All those who are Christ's are having the kingdom of God, have the kingdom of God within them. We have Christ in us. We have the king. We belong to the king. Are we in the service of our king? 
Do we know and have we entered into the service of our King? Do we allow him to have that lordship of our life, that monarchy reign in our life? Do we realize that we have entered into his service? I think you'd be forgiven for most of Christianity today. Most professing Christians think that the king is at our service. If you're still in 2 Timothy chapter 2, would you look with me at verses number 3 and number 4? Thou, this is speaking to Christians, thou meaning you, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If you're in Christ, and you're saved. Well, you can't be one without the other. You can't be saved without being in Christ, and you can't be in Christ without being saved. I wonder if you realize this this morning. You are a soldier in the service of the king. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You're in the service of the king, and the king knows you. And the king speaks to you from the word of God this morning, Christian. He says, and if you are mine, you are a soldier. And you are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And not to be so wrapped up and entangled by the things of this world that you are no longer pleasing him who chose you to be a soldier. Could you imagine this unknown warrior? who died on the battlefields of France, if he hadn't got his head in the game, if he wasn't following the instructions of his captain and his commander, if he wasn't willing to endure hardness in the king's service. You see, the Lord knoweth every one of us who are in Christ. The Lord does not give an opt-out. The Lord calls us to endure hardness and not to be so entangled in the world. Why? Because we're in the king's service first and foremost. As the men, if you will, took the king's shilling, that was the price that was paid for them to be in the service of the king. And they were then in the service of the king because they accepted the price that was paid. May I say to you this morning, Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price to purchase us. For ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. What is the price? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. To those of you who are Christians this morning, to those of you who are in Christ, to those of you who have looked to Christ, received Christ in full and final forgiveness of all your sins, who've taken his promise by grace through faith, who have the assurance of eternal life in heaven and joy and all hope. You've taken the king's shilling. You've taken his precious blood. The price has been paid. Ye are not your own. You're a soldier of Christ. You have entered into the service of the king. What does your life look like this morning? What does my life look like this morning? Are we greeting and meeting the king every day and telling him how he must serve us? Or are we finding our rightful place as a soldier of the king and asking not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? Not what your king can do for you, but what you can do for your king. He had entered the king's service. Secondly, at the tomb of the unknown warrior, we find this, he had paid the price in the king's service. Those of you who are familiar with any military history, anything to do with World War I, know that every single man, woman who went out there, the nurses, everybody, it doesn't matter who was out there on that Western Front, every single one of them paid a price. It was mud, blood, Guts, gore. Now, some of us now, many of us were of a certain age, we were kind of brought up on the glories of the wars, the sterilized filmages, the heroism, 
You know, we, we, we weren't familiar with the mud and the drowning in the shell holes and the frostbite and the freezing cold and the deprivation and the men lying screaming in agony in no man's land and anybody who tried to get them back was taken off by a sniper. We weren't familiar with that in the films. We weren't familiar with the reality. As the reality of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ has been sterilized even in the minds of believers, then the truth of the horrors of the battlefields of World War I were sterilized. I think we have something more of a reality today. You see, he paid the price in the king's service. Never mind the horror of being away from your family, the fear of death, the shelling, the artillery, the mud, the blood, the death of loved ones next to you and around you, friends next to you and around you. They had to endure the horror of a new terrorizing weapon in World War I, chlorine gas. Never been seen or used before, used by the Germans on the battle. They let off cylinders and a wall of greenish yellow gas came towards those troops. They didn't have any gas masks. They were soaking rags and handkerchiefs in the muddy water, putting it over their mouths, trying to breathe. And I read the account of one Canadian captain who said it was only 10 minutes. He said, but our lungs were given up. Many men couldn't even keep the mask, the watered mask over their, their face for 10 minutes, and they sucked in those few. Many of them died a horrifying death. You say, what was that? They paid the price in the king's service. I think of a poignant photo of, um, of eight Australians who were in the battle. Well, they were pictured in the trench before the Battle of Fromel. Uh, it was one of the worst uh, most horrifying losses of life, particularly for the Australian Empire troops in the First World War. They always talk of Gallipoli, of course, but for Mel, was a huge loss of life. There's a poignant photo. There are eight men with their cigarettes, as they did there in those days, in the trench before they went up and over. Of those eight men, five died. The other three were wounded. So what was that? They paid the price. <clears throat> In the service of the king. This brings us to our second verse that is on the tomb of the unknown warrior, and it's on the side. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Let's start at verse 12. John 15 and verse 12, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. There's the standard. Christians are called to love one another as Christ loved us. Verse number 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. If you do whatsoever I have commanded you. Jesus Christ says we must love as Christ loved us. And this is before the cross. Christ was speaking to them of the standard of love was the paying the price, the price that he paid on Calvary. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. The tomb of the unknown warrior says on the side, greater love hath no man than this. You see, that unknown warrior laid down his life for his friends and for strangers and for you and for me as yet unborn. There is no greater price that can be paid. All who were there, even those who lived and came through that First World War, don't tell me they did not pay a price. Or you can call it shell shock, PTSD, you can call it what you like, but there is no one that served in the service of the king that didn't pay a price. Now let's just flip that back, Christian. Are we in the service of the king? We've already looked at that. Did he tell us we're soldiers in his service? We've looked at that. Greater love 
hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. They physically paid the price in the service of the king. Christian, can you look at your Christian life and say that you are paying the price in the service of the king? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God calls us soldiers. God has shown us the imagery of a soldier. In the tomb of the unknown warrior, we see the life of a soldier that endured freezing conditions, horrific conditions, death, destruction, mud, blood, gas. He paid a price. That's the picture that is given in the Bible to the soldiers of Christ to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How is your life looking this morning, Christian? Can you look back past or present to something in your life and say, I am paying a price in the service of the king. There is something in my life that isn't all about me. There's something that I do that isn't just for me, my benefit, my comfort, my pleasure. The tomb of the unknown warrior shows us he paid the price in the service of the king. Question, we're called to pay a price in the service of the king. You see, when Jesus Christ said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It may even be easy to some to say to men, I'll give my life willingly. The history of the church 2,000 years is of Christian martyrs who gave their life. But what about just something in your daily life that makes you uncomfortable? Are you willing to pay a price in the service of the king that will make you uncomfortable, that will make your life difficult? That you, when you get to go into the presence of your Savior, will at least have the comfort amidst all your sin and rebellion of knowing there is something that you did in your service for Christ the King that meant you were paying the price. The tomb of the unknown warrior had entered the King's service. He paid the price in the King's service. Thirdly, this, he died unknown by the world in the king's service. I explained a little bit in the introduction about how that came to pass. He was and is an unknown warrior. It is the tomb of the unknown warrior. The world knows him not. His name is not on the newspapers. His name is not up in lights. He didn't return to his community as a hero. He didn't return wearing a Victoria Cross. He wasn't offered free food. He wasn't given the freedom of the city. The world has no idea who he is. The soldier in the king's service suffering hardship and ultimate price of death was and is completely Unknown by the world. No glory. No glamour. No position. No prestige. No possessions. Nothing. Uh, now we come to the other side of the grave. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number nine, as unknown and yet well known. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking of some of the things in the ministry, some of the offense, the problems, the necessities, the distresses, the difficulties, the things that he'd been through for Christ. And it, and it comes here as verse known where he says, as a, as a minister, as a soldier of Christ, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a known yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. 
You see the inscription, the part of that verse that's on the other side of the tomb of the unknown soldier is unknown and yet well known, dying and behold, we live. You see, he's unknown, yet he's well known. But in his life, think of who this man was. He's unknown on the back. Nobody knows who he is. But somebody would have known him when he was alive. Somebody would have been in the trench with him. Somebody would have been on the battlefield with him. Somebody would have lost sight of him. Maybe he had a family at home. You see, he is now unknown, and he was unknown. It could be from the state of the body of the battlefield. He was unrecognizable. Unknown, yet well known. Dead, yet alive. The tomb of the unknown warrior is there today. Dying and behold, we live. Christian, let's, let, let's flip that across to you and me today. Maybe we're not known by the world. Maybe as Christians, we don't have a position of prestige or pride or power. Maybe we're completely unknown to the people of the world, but he was unknown in the service of the king. He was known by the king. Friend, do you, do you worry that you don't get the recognition that you feel that you should? Does it bother you that the world doesn't receive you as a soldier in the service of the king and lift you up with military honors and say how wonderful you are for serving Jesus Christ? You're unknown. You're a nobody. The apostle Paul actually described himself as the offscary, the scum that comes off flesh that's who we are positionally in Christ we are nobodies we are unknown by the world that doesn't matter because we're known by the king you say it's like my life has no, nothing going on nothing to I, I'm, I'm not popular I don't even feel like I'm living life well unknown Yet known. You see, are you known for Christ or are you known for the world? See, dying and yet we live. He died unknown to the world. He died for the world. But he is known to the king. Friends, in many senses, like that unknown soldier, we have to die to the world. We have to die unknown as nobodies in the world, but we are known by the king. Dead, yet living. Alive in Christ. Alive evermore. He entered the king's service. He paid the price in the king's service. He died unknown by the world in the king's service. But here's a wonderful truth that brings us back down to Westminster in that procession home that started in France. And it is wonderful if you read the detail of that. Brings us to our fourth point this morning. He was brought home to the king. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the verse at the base of the tombstone. First Corinthians chapter 15. And verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, this unknown warrior was brought home. He wasn't left. Yes, he'd endured hardship. Yes, he'd gone into the king's service. Yes, he was unknown by the world. Yes, he had paid the price. But he was brought home at the end to the presence of the king. And that day on the 11th of November, 1920, he was back in the presence of the king. 
And verse number 22 says, in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, there's a, there's a two-edged truth here depending on where you sit this morning. You see, in Christ shall all be made alive. There is no one in this room, in this nation, and this planet today, yesterday, or tomorrow who will not come into the presence of Christ the King. In Christ, as in Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. We all die because of the sin of Adam. Sin and death entered the world through Adam, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. But friend, if you're under the mistaken illusion today, in fact, whatever illusion or delusion you're under today, that this is it, you'll shuffle off this mortal coil, and then whatever version you've got of the end times, my religion will help me, my good works will help me, my chakras, my mantras, my whatever it is, you fill in the blank. I've got to tell you on the authority of the word of God this morning, it will count for nothing. At the name of Christ, Every knee shall bow and every son shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The question is not will you see Christ. The question is, is how will you see Christ when you meet him? Will you meet him as your savior, your king, whose service you've been in? Or will you meet him as your judge? The king who brings judgment. You see, the unknown warrior was brought home to the king. Everyone will be brought home to the king. The question is, what will happen when you meet the king? The king has authority. And he has the authority to welcome you into his kingdom. And he has the authority to prevent you from going into his kingdom. He said, well, on that day, I'll make my case. On that day, God has already told you it will be too late. Jesus Christ said in John 11, 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And those are wonderful words of comfort that Christ gave to Martha before he called forth Lazarus out of the tomb after four days of death, such that his flesh was stinking. The tomb will not save you. Death will not save you. Death is not the end. You will not be annihilated. You will not go into some dreamlike sleep state. You will not go on to the next universe, the next life, the next reincarnation. You'll be called forth as Lazarus was out of the tomb. And you will meet the king. Christian, isn't it a wonderful, wonderful truth? That we may be in this world as unknown warriors, soldiers in the service of the king, enduring the hardships as every good soldier of Jesus Christ must endure, as we fight the good fight of faith, if we do anything of service in for Christ in this world, there will be a price that you and I are paying. And it may even lead up to the ultimate price, but know this, every soldier of the Lord will be brought home to meet the King. Go to John 14. John 14. Christian, you may be paying the price. You may be living a life for Christ. You may be paying the price of ridicule, revilement, rejection, loss of funds, loss of health, loss of status, loss of all kinds of things. And you can fill it in. You know what your life is like. But Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. John 14, verse number one. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know. And the way, you know. Jesus Christ said he'll bring the Christian soldier home to the king. The unknown warrior was brought home to the king. Unknown by the world. Christian, you may be unknown by the world. You may be paying the price. You may be suffering hardship. But you have the promise that when you fought the good fight of faith, when you've endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, at the end of it all, you may die in this world unknown, unliked, unloved, and uncared for, but the king says he will bring us home. You're not unknown to the king. Lastly, this morning, as we look at this, these Bible verses on the tomb of the unknown warrior, we find he'd entered the king's service. Have you? Have you? He paid the price in the king's service. Are you? He died unknown by the world in the king's service. Are you, are you seeking to be known by the world or be known by Christ? He was brought home to the king. Christian, you have the great promises of the wonderful rapture, the blessed hope when Christ takes us home to the king. And lastly, this morning, the last verse on that tombstone says this of the unknown soldier. He was honored by the king. We've had a New Testament verse at the top of the tomb, the bottom of the tomb, the right, left-hand side of the tomb, the right-hand side of the tomb. The fifth partial Bible verse is from the Old Testament, and it's at the very end of the text that is inscribed on it. And it's back in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 24. If you just turn there. Look at verse number 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse number 16. The Bible says, And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. The part of that verse that is on the bottom of the inscription that we read earlier is they buried him among the kings because he had done good toward God and toward his house. You see, on that day when he was brought back and buried in Westminster Abbey among the kings, there are 30 kings and queens buried in Westminster Abbey. And the unknown soldier was brought back to Westminster Abbey. And he was uh, brought back with full military honours. There's actually a photograph before it gets to Westminster Abbey of the horse-drawn carriage with the coffin on the top of King George V who takes a wreath and he lays it and places it on top of the coffin of the unknown soldier. Do you know what that looks like to me? Because he's actually up near the head. And it's like the king putting a crown on the soldier for his faithful service. And that crowned soldier, unknown to man, known to the king, the king puts a crown on his head for his service. And he's paraded with full military honours to Westminster Abbey. They buried him among the kings because he had done good toward God and toward his house. He was honoured by the king. The king, the king of the British Empire, honoured a soldier for his service, yet unknown by the world, honoured by the king. Would you turn to Matthew 25? 
Christian, I hope you're understanding me this morning. I hope I'm being clear this morning. May God help us to have clarity of understanding this morning. Matthew 25, verse number 23. There's the parable of the talents. We won't take the time to read it. I'm sure you're familiar with it. If you're not, please do look it up. But look at we're looking at the conclusion in verse number 23. And it's a, it's a parabolic story of the Lord in glory, if you will. We're related again to an illustration on earth. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things i will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of the lord christ the king will give honor christ the king will give honor to his soldiers to his servants the lord him Self will say to those who have paid the price in the king's service, well done, good and faithful servant. The unknown warrior was honored by the king. The world didn't know who he was. Friend, are you an unknown warrior? In the service of the king. Because you need to know this wonderful truth from the word of God. The world may not know you. The world may not like you. The world may despise you. The world may imprison you. The world may ultimately see you dispatched. But if you are in the service of the king, Christian, you will ultimately be honored by the king, the king himself, just like that picture of King George V, placing the wreath, the crown on the unknown warrior's head. First Peter 5, 4 says, and when the chief shepherd, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, first Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Jesus Christ the King will place the crown, crown of glory on those who have paid the price in the service of the King. Christian, are you paying the price? Are you serving the King? Are you enduring the hardship because you know the promises of God? That no matter what you go through, for your king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will bring you home. And he, the king himself, will give you honors. It's incredible to me. But when I think back to this unknown warrior, let, let me give you another quote from an English classicist, John Maxwell Edmonds, who died in 1958. And this is a quote that is often used in, in terms of remembrance. It's slightly changed for the, the Burma Memorial, but this was the, the original. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrows, they gave their today. Now think about that quote. Say, yes, it's wonderful. Now, Christian, you think about that quote. In the human realm, the physical realm, the soldiers of the human king gave their todays. They sacrificed their todays. They served through difficulty and lost their life in that service today so that we got tomorrows Christian the unsaved of this world are going to hell in their millions and our king says the same to us will we give our two days in the service of the king in the commission 
of the gospel? Will we be willing to pay the price and endure the sacrifices necessary to endure the hardship that steals our todays? Will we willingly give our todays as those human soldiers did? That the rest of the people in this world may get the gospel that they will have a tomorrow. That isn't a tomorrow in the torments and the agonies of hell itself and the very flames of eternal punishment. Will they have a tomorrow that's in hope and in heaven? Will they have a tomorrow in the presence of the king? Will they have that tomorrow as they go along drinking, partying, fornicating, living this world? Will you and I say, oh, we don't want to sacrifice for them. We don't want to endure any hardship for them. Will we be unwilling to give our todays that some of them may receive the gospel and have a tomorrow? That's the message of the unknown world. Christian, will you pay the price today? Will you sacrifice today? Will you surrender today that someone in eternity will be there because we as soldiers served the king and paid the price. Or will there be no difference? Will there be no difference between the soldiers of Christ and the people of this world? Will they see no difference in our life, in our lips, in our service? Will we just serve ourselves as the rest of the world does? And just go along in the presence of the king because we got our number. We got our army number. We took the king's shield. But then we went a wall, absolute without leave. We weren't there at the battle front. We weren't in the mud, the blood and the guts. We signed up, we took the promise, and then we just disappeared somewhere. Christian, you may be an unknown warrior in this life. You and I are very, very unlikely to receive the honors of this world. But if you're in the service of the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, can I tell you this this morning? You are in the service of the only one who has any importance whatsoever. You're in the service of the king. He knows you by name, even if the world wouldn't give you a second look. One day, your warfare will be over. One day, your hardships will be over. One day, your service will be over. And the king will bring you home. The king will bring you to his presence and the king will give you the full honors for your service and for your sacrifice. There is much, there is much, a simple gravestone linked with the verses of the Bible can teach us, can show us and can expect from us. May God help us. May God help us to even just meet the standards of many a good man and woman in this world. May God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to go beyond that in the service of our King, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, what remembrance. What a lesson even this world can teach us. Father, the unknown warrior died in a day. Died in a day where even Westminster Abbey put the word of God forth. Where Christ was still, to a greater degree, magnified, known, and spoken of in this land. 
Jerusalem. Full honours before the king and full honours before the Lord. Father, maybe in this day we've kept the pageantry and the worldly honour. But your word has no place today. Father, isn't it sad that those in your service, your soldiers, your unknown warriors, maybe even your word has no place today. Heavenly Father, help us to be the soldiers of Christ that we need to be. To realize that there needs to be a sacrifice. It isn't all about us. May we serve Jesus Christ, our King, looking forward to the great promises we have, knowing no matter what this world brings, our King will bring us on, and our King will give his rewards to his soldiers. Father, I pray particularly this morning for anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray it's not because we are not giving our todays. And therefore they will have no joyful tomorrows. Help us, Lord, to suffer, to endure the despisement, the ridicule, the rejection as Christ did. As we serve our King faithfully. Let the difficulties come. Let the attacks come. But let us stand on our Western Front. And stand until the King brings us home. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.